Thank you very much for that prayer. It's nice to begin the, the day that way. I'm Charles Dahlquist, and I'm glad to be with you. Before I uh, introduce uh, Consul General Dodds to you, I want to introduce him to you. Right now, all he knows is that it's very difficult to negotiate in between classes in a golf cart when everybody has their iPods in their ears or is checking their emails <laughs> or text messaging. And, and uh, But it's a vibrant, vital uh, uh, campus, and I am grateful to be part of you, and it brought back some wonderful memories when I was here at Brigham Young University, and so thank you for who you are. Now, Consul Droughts, I will tell you that you'll find no uh, greater student body any place in the world than here at Brigham Young University, and it's particularly diversified. Let me just ask, how many of you have lived overseas? Okay. How many of you have lived in Germany? How many of you have lived in Eastern? Or, no, raise your hands high if you've lived in Germany. Okay, great. How many of you have lived in Western uh, or in Eastern Europe? Okay, where Russia, Russia. Ukraine, okay, Poland. Poland, okay. How many of you have lived in Asia? Okay, what countries? Japan, China, China? China. Thailand, Thailand. Cambodia. Cambodia, where? China. China. Are you from China? Mm -hmm. Great. Where? Um, three hours south of Beijing. Great. Great. And how many of you have lived in Latin America? Okay. All right, where? What countries? Brazil. Brazil? Mexico. Mexico. Brazil. Brazil. Argentina. Argentina. Ecuador. Ecuador. Argentina. Argentina. Great. Let's see, what else? How many of you have uh, lived in Africa? Nobody. How many of you have been to Africa? Okay, great. <laughs> I will just, who did I forget? Did I forget some area of the country that I, or the world that I should have? The Middle East. How many of you have been to the Middle East? How many of you have lived in the Middle East? Okay. How many of you speak a second language? Okay. How many of you speak a third language? How many of you speak a fourth language? Okay. How about a fifth language? Oh! Who, who speaks five languages? I've got one here. Okay. Stand up, would you please? Which languages? Great. That's great. Native German from where? Hanover. From Hanover, where they speak the clearest, best German, <laughs> right? Okay, which is one of my favorite cities. Well, thank you for coming here. I'm going to introduce you to our brand new uh, Consul General, Wolfgang Drauz, who is here uh, from uh, Los Angeles. He is currently posted in Los Angeles. He comes to us from Chicago, uh, where he was the Consul General there. He has been in a number of places in the world, he's uh, served in Berlin. He joined the Foreign uh, Office in 1976. He has served in Moscow twice. He understands the issues that you and I are dealing with internationally, and he is just a great friend of the United States. He has had a number of posts, a number of responsibilities, including arms control and different things wherever he has gone, but he's just a great individual to have now in Los Angeles, which is a vibrant headquarters and a great uh, consulate. So I'm pleased to introduce to you today Wolfgang Drauz, our Consul General from the Federal Republic of Germany. Thank you, Charles. Guten Morgen. Bon dia. Um, what, what else can I say? Dobry dien. Dobry dien. Yeah. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. It's the second time. Uh, but the first time officially, so to say, I'm uh, grateful for the invitation. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have much time, but I have one preliminary remark. I'm here today, also I have this uh, title, I'm not the official spokesman of the German government, because this would, would prevent us from having really good conversation. I know in many fields you are the big, bigger, the better expert than I am. And I, I'm surprised you took all the speak about Germany. Please interrupt if it gets too boring, too technical. I see uh, to my dismay, I mean, when Charles was a student here, the first row was first to be filled, and not the last like today. Uh, they were courageous men. They are heroes, you know. Uh, but, but here, uh, uh, well, you see what happened. Anyway, I'm not the, the government spokesman, but I'm interested in your opinion, your experiences of Germany, good or bad. Don't, don't, don't feel uh, 
shy. I, I really, uh, I'm happy also to answer questions if I can. If not, I will say I don't know. And that happens very often in this world, which get, becomes more and more complicated even for me. And sometimes it's more uh, difficult for me to sort out all the information which is coming in and to decide what is really priority and what is important than uh, in, the, in the past. Um, I uh, was asked to speak about the end of the Grand Coalition, Germany's new government and global indication for its neighbors, NATO and nuclear strategy. I don't know who, who selected this, uh, but it would, of course, be about two days and a half <laughs> for, for each individual subject, NATO or nuclear or uh, new government. And uh, so I can only touch upon some of the points and you you tell me later what you really are interested in, and then we can elaborate more. Um, 2009, of course, was an important year for Germany, for the German-American relations, and for Europe. Uh, first, Germany, I rapidly uh, repeat what you perhaps know already. We had a jubilee, 60 years of Germany, 60 years ago, the Grundgesetz was promulgated, our constitution, which is a basis, was after the Second World War, you know, the catastrophe for the German uh, people, nation, and all what happened. Uh, so the Grundgesetz, which was heavily influenced by our new friends, American allies and Democrats, we should always remember this, when you suddenly ask us today to do things, at that time they didn't want us to do, at the time we, we had no armed forces and we're not any more inclined to go to war, which is uh, nowadays a different... We can go into this discussion later. Then last year we celebrated 20 years of the fall of the Berlin Wall, the first and the fast of you, and those who sit in the front perhaps. I have still a couple of T-shirts there with uh, freedom without walls. Help yourself afterwards. Uh, 20 years of the Berlin Wall, which means unification. Unification not only for Germany, but also for Europe, the Iron Curtain came down, Soviet Union imploded, enlargement of EU. Um, and we had, as uh, the title of my given uh, presentation says, general elections. We had general elections which brought a new coalition. We have coalition governments, as you know, in Germany, which is not well known in the rest of the world what, how this works. And in particular, the last coalition, so-called Grand Coalition, the end of the Grand Coalition, meant you have uh, social democrats and Christian democrats in, a, in one administration. I mean, uh, this would be like here, Republicans, Democrats in one administration. It's not unthinkable. It's not thinkable. So this grand coalition came to an end. We have now the Free Democratic Party and the Christian Democrats, the same Chancellor, Merkel, and the new minister, uh, Westerwelle, from the Free Democrats. I always say Free Democrats, because in Germany we say the Liberal Party, but liberal, again, in this system means something else. And if you say here liberal, they shoot you or they... <laughs> <laughs> um, and my new minister, and I'm not illoyal because he outed himself, you know, he is from the other faculty. Uh, and so uh, we have really a new coalition. And uh, I haven't seen a great speech of him yet because he's brand new in his job. So I will refer later more to the Chancellor, uh, Merkel, because first of all she is head of government and she did some uh, very nice uh, speeches and statements. Um, possibly you know that the result of the election was important in the sense we have a broader spectrum of parties now in Parliament. When I was young we had three parties, the Social Democrats, the Free Democrats and the Christian Democrats. Then in the, when was it, 70s, the Greens started and became more and more powerful. Joschka Fischer, many years foreign minister. The Green parties came. And now uh, we have a left party. And to my dismay, surprise, disappointed, disappointment, left party got 11%, which is very high if you think that the left party are, I say so, the leftovers of the former Stasi. I mean... It's a little bit rough, but it's in a way true that many uh, discontent people from the former East and in East Berlin, the nomenclature, they, they still vote for the left party, 
uh, and that makes it interesting with 11% and growing numbers. And we have two coalition governments in Germany, in Berlin and in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, where the left party is actually governing with the Social Democrats. And in my home state, Salem is very, was very close also with La Fontaine. So we have this uh, interesting uh, spectrum of parties. We do not have, and I insist in this country, it's important to know a right-wing party in our Bundestag, in our parliament. The right-wing people did not make it uh, to, uh, to the Bundestag. Now, um, the basis of the, uh, um, the government uh, is, of course, uh, a coalition, we call it coalition treaty, a coalition agreement, where the two political parties agree what their program, their strategy should be. And then, when they settle, we sign it, and you can read it, I could quote a lot of it. Then the, uh, the head of the government, it's, it, this, uh, it's Chancellor Merkel, Angela Merkel, she uh, enters the Bundestag with a, uh, a statement, a government statement, what her program will be. And since you are interested in Germany, and I was asked to speak about Germany's new government, I give you roughly the uh, five, five uh, new uh, uh, priorities of her government, her administration. Um, well, we all know we stand, as you, in the middle of, I think we are not over it, of an economic uh, crisis. So no wonder what her priorities are. The first is overcoming the consequences of the crisis. The new federal government wants to create a, the preconditions for stronger growth, massive spending cuts, of course. Um, they have, uh, we have a uh, unemployment rate about 7.3%, which is heavy enough, but in this country, when I started in Chicago, it was below 5%. Now, in my new posting in, in Los Angeles, we are at 14% unemployment. So, really, uh, um, unemployment is a, a, big, a big issue also in Germany. Um, this was the first, overcoming the consequences of the crisis. Um, second is improving relations between citizens and government. Behind this very abstract uh, clause, it means reforms of the tax system. Very popular with politicians during the campaign, but when it comes to deliver, it's more complicated. And now our new finance minister, the former minister of interior, Schäuble, he's the old hand in the government, and he says, tax reform, tax breaks, we can't do it. How do you want to finance it and have uh, other you know, stimulus packages? So this is one. The third is, the third point of this government program is answering to demographic change. And you, if you've been to Germany, you know German society is aging and shrinking. Aging and shrinking, uh, uh, and uh, it cannot be the shrinking compensated by immigration. And immigration is another problem we can talk about later. So aging society, uh, changes in the social and retirement pension systems, all this is interconnected. The fourth point is what we call in good German climate protection, climate change, environmental policy. Environmental policies is a much higher uh, importance in, in Europe, in Germany in particular, than in the US. I have always difficulties in, in speaking about the it was a, a, a term created by my former minister, transatlantic climate bridge. People are not interested when I come speaking about, in abstract, about climate change. They want to have something tangible. If I connect it to renewable energies, for example, energy mix or something, it's more, more uh, um, interesting. In Germany, this is now a new issue, mix of conventional and renewable energy, because the old government, Social Democrats and Green Party, of course, was 100, 150% for out of nuclear, nuclear power stations. The new government with the Free Democratic Party at least says we need some uh, nuclear for a transitional period, but only transitional. The, the definite uh, uh, decision to go out of nuclear still stands. It's only a matter now of time and when we can afford it. 
So also we are we have a lot of, of environmental regulation. We are as Germany, so to say, dif disappointed with Copenhagen because it, it didn't bring uh, a sound result. And uh, but we still go on fighting for our our ideals in, in in renewables and climate change in Europe, but also in Germany. And the fifth or the uh, new finding a balance between liberty and security. You understand what that means? We are not as heavily influenced by 9-11 and consequences, but we feel also in the, in the, in the world the, the threats of terrorism and um, the also, I must admit, the threat of, um, uh, and I feel it when I travel here and we talked about it, about your personal freedom, the liberties. When you go to an airport, to any place now, how you are stripped and, uh, and screened and w whatever, it's, it's, it's really difficult to find a balance that you have a life and, and security. So these are the four, the five points from uh, the, the Chancellor Merkel's uh, statement, government statement in the Bundestag. Um, let me go on. Um, German-US relations, briefly. Of course, I mentioned already the fall of the Berlin Wall. It could not have happened without the, the backing, the support of the Americans. And in fact, the, the contribution of the United States to German security and to German unification is, is tremendous. And we are really grateful. It started right after Second World War with the Berlin Airlift, which was not only a, uh, a humanitarian gesture to save two million people, three million people, but also a strategic decision. It was the beginning of the post-war American-German friendship, really. The friendship is much older, but in between we had these dark times. Anyway, the fall, the, uh, the Berlin airlift, and then in the Cold War, we had thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of GIs stationed in Germany. And this is, to me, something interesting because uh, when the, uh, the wall came down and, and Europe, so to say, was free again, the Americans withdraw and we have now, at the peak, we had 400,000 GIs, now we have 40,000. This means there is also less contact between our people because all the former GIs and the former soldiers and, and, and service personnel who served in Germany were all positive about Germany, positive impressions. Sometimes their wives and husbands came from that country and so on. This bridge is now smaller because 40,000, not 400,000 or millions. And uh, somehow I'm not, not, I don't know how to replace it. You can replace it by business relations, but we have also to replace it by exchange of students, by tourists and others. Um, so we had the, uh, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, we had, of course, in this country, the election of Obama. And those who, of you who spent last year in Germany know how popular he was and still is in Germany. He was at the time, uh, or he perhaps is not now even more popular in Germany than in this country. When I gave a little lecture in Indian Wells, which is a, a, a south of Palm Springs, rich, old, conservative people, and I said, and Obama is very popular in Germany. They yelled at me from the public that, but you are not stuck with him. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was an interesting <laughs> That was <laughs> This is not for recording, but... Uh, <laughs> um, Anyway, uh, he is very popular, and now uh, comes. He was in Germany uh, for the NATO, you know, this Jubilee summit. He was at Baden-Baden. He was at Berlin, and um, we work together on many fields. And I would simply now uh, come to really one highlight of German-American relations, which was the visit of Chancellor Merkel in in Washington in November. And she was the first, really the first, given the opportunity to speak in front of both houses of Congress. And she gave a good speech about the uh, German-American relations. 
And um, she mentioned a couple of points I would refer to now, or quote even. She said, people in Germany and in the United States, in America, are afraid of globalization, which is true because many people are afraid when you see what, what happened to the world economy. But she said they are not only uh, afraid of globalization, there is also global opportunities and chances and challenges. And this, uh, these global opportunities and chances forces us to act together with others. So independently, uh, we cannot overcome the problem. We must work together. Alternative to, uh, um, to this cooperation would be shutting ourselves off from others, which means uh, isolation and misery. So this is not an alternative, a real alternative anymore. We must think, she said in that speech, in terms of alliances, of partnership. They will take us into a good future. Now, she also mentioned very openly that the US and the EU have had disagreements. Disagreements, if I say it in, in, the, in the broader sense, the Europeans were considered often by Americans too hesitant and too fearful. On the other hand, uh, Germans, Europeans thought the US is off too headstrong and too pushy. These were basically the philosophical differences. But uh, she said also, there is no better partner for Europe than America, and no better partner for America than Europe. And that is, that is really true. Um, she referred to our common values. She said, we, we do not have just a, a shared history, which we do. When you look at the ancestry here in Utah, how many come from Germany and Europe, you know, shared history. We have shared interests. We have common global challenges facing us. But she said, there is more than that. We have a common basis of shared values. We have common idea, the common idea of the individual and his inviolable dignity. And we have a common understanding of freedom in responsibility, freedom in responsibility. It is the basis of value that will enable us to stand to the tests of our times. Uh, Germany is united, Europe is united, so what is our task? We, will, we must build now peace and security also beyond these borders. We must achieve prosperity and justice, and we must protect our planet. So uh, she said something, what does this mean? And I quote her, first, uh, it means uh, building peace and security, uh, uh, here, America and Europe are called upon in a very special way. And then she, she said something interesting, perhaps in this uh, context here in particular. This is why the ability to show tolerance is so important. While for us, our way of life is the best possible way, as it do not necessarily feel that way. There are different ways to create peaceful coexistence. Tolerance means showing respect for other people's history, traditions, religion, and cultural identity. But let there be no misunderstanding. Tolerance does not mean anything goes, and the only continues. Do you understand what I would like uh, to, to say so? Now, uh, this was a great speech. I have a text somewhere here, and it's also here and other. If you don't have, with your electronic means, easy, download it, read it. It's really the basis of our, of our uh, uh, bilateral relationship. Now, um, uh, to, my, uh, to my surprise, I found in my given uh, here uh, task, uh, NATO a nuclear strategy. I was a little bit surprised, but uh, let's go. If you are an expert, I'm not, but we can talk about it. I, I tell you only a, a little bit, when you talk about nuclear strategy to a drum, the first thing I thought, do you want to speak about the civil side? You know, nuclear power stations going out and how much is this uh, in, in, in the, the energy mix? can talk about it. I said Germany is going out of nuclear energy, which is tough for us because we cannot replace it easily. We have no oil, we have no gas. That's why our connection with Russia. Um, 
going out of nuclear, um, there is the industry, the business themselves, they tell you now it's not economically viable. Because up to now, if you calculate only building a nuclear power station, it's okay and producing the energy. But decommissioning a nuclear power station, you don't know how many billion it costs and how difficult it is. And we have no repository for the nuclear waste. And now not a surprise to you, or perhaps a, uh, a surprise to you, do you know that this country does not have a, a repository? No country in the world has up to now a single repository where it's safe to store nuclear waste for the next 10,000 years. We talk about 10 and more thousand years to keep it safe. I was recently in, uh, in um, Colorado, Rocky Flats, what it, yeah, Rocky Flats. There they simply dump it somewhere and fill it in and, and they think it's safe for next 20,000 years. It's still hot and warm. You, you are not allowed to go into it because it's, it's still uh, in a way going. So Germany is going definitely out of nuclear, which is very difficult because our French neighbors, friends in the, U, in the, in the EU, they have 70% or 80% of electricity coming from nuclear power stations. We were, in, when we had this nuclear uh, uh, um, age, let me say, we were, we thought we were smart. We simply sent and sold our nuclear waste to the French and to the British. It went up to Dunray in Scotland, to Sellafield and to La Hague, and the French said, yes, we, we process it or we burn it or we don't. But in this contract, there's also a clause after 20 or 30 years, we must take back the rest. And we don't know how to do it, and transport is a big problem. Now, here in this country, you had billions, I speak literally of billions of dollars invested in Yucca Mountain. Yucca Mountain, a little bit south here in Arizona, and they didn't finish it, they stopped it. Because it's neither politically, not, not uh, um, uh, uh, physically, uh, the display, they don't know what to do. They don't know, they store it. I was in, in, in Chicago, excellent host nuclear power station, 200 yards from the Michigan lake where they store nuclear fuel on the ground. You know, and they simply wait for a solution. And the scientists tell us, well, we don't know, but we work on the third generation of nuclear power stations where we can burn it, but then you still have plutonium and all this. So this was, so to say, when you mentioned nuclear strategy, there is a civil side we can talk about. The military side is even more interesting, of course, because of um, the international well, complications with North Korea, Iran, and others. And I must tell you, when I worked at the arms control dis in this armament desk, at that time, we were very, I was working also on the Star Treaty. Do you know that the Star Treaty was, uh, so to say, uh, run out, ended in December last year, in this December? So there is no existing treaty anymore. And the Obama administration, other people said, yes, this is a top priority with the Russians. We will have a new strategic arms treaty. They are not, not even starting to talk about it because as many uh, politicians here, senators, send letters to the unusuals. Before you start about limitations and reductions, we must have modernize, we must modernize our nuclear arsenal. So now they are building first the next generation and mini nukes and so on, and then they start talking about reducing it, which is for somebody who feel already that it's I'm anti nuclear weapons uh, um, is, is very, very difficult. Now you mu must if you want to uh, to uh, convince people um, to abstain from nuclear weapons, and that's basically what the world would like to convince the Iranians from doing. Um, there are, I, I would say, at least three elements you must bear in mind. The fear of nuclear, of non-nuclear states. You must somehow overcome their fear that people with nuclear weapons are a threat to them. Then there is, unfortunately, this world is a vanity fair, there is the prestige of nuclear weapons. Many think if you are a nuclear power, you have a higher prestige, 
And indeed, look at the Security Council. We can later talk about the uh, United Nations here. Um, nuclear weapons give some weight and prestige. And so some people probably uh, would like to have it. And then you must, of course, prevent the proliferation risk. And the proliferation risk comes not only from the nuclear weapons, but also from civil nuclear energy. Now, this is a big debate. Iran says we want only energy, civil nuclear. Uh, and, and everybody knows when you have uh, nuclear power stations, you have also the, the possibility to, to enrich and to build the bomb. So there are these elements. And um, in my uh, uh, in the old days, you know, the, the international strategy with uh, nuclear weapons, and that is really, it, it's, it's ironic, was uh, in abbreviation called MAD, M-A-D, which stands for Mutually Assured Destruction. <laughs> yeah, that was the official strategy. So can you, isn't that mad to have such a, a, a concept in the world? But this was the official policy. And uh, it's, it's very interesting if you read in the, uh, I think, foreign affairs of last month about how the, the nuclear came into the world. Because in fact, from 1944, 45 to about three, four years, there was a, a, a window of opportunity where only the US had the monopoly on nuclear weapons. But then somehow the Cold War started and they were building up arsenals and they have thousands and thousands. At my time, there were 10,000 in the Soviet Union and here 8,000. They promised in the START treaty, the first treaty was solved strategic arms limitation, so not to build up more. Second treaty was strategic arms reductions to bring it down. And they promised the world, we will bring it down and give a good example. They didn't do it. And there are still thousands, and they, they talk about modernizing and about how we can keep up. And uh, that is a little bit frustrating. Fortunately, we sit and we sit under this umbrella and we're happy to have this nuclear umbrella. But uh, if you, as a leading nation, say other, no, you should not have it, and you have it in mass, and you're building it, and you're improving it, that is a very uh, uh, difficult argument. So um, the nuclear, the nuclear uh, issue will, will stay with us a long time. And I, I don't know. Uh, where we end up, but I know that Germany is not a nuclear power, neither military nor, nor, nor civil will go out. And that is why we are perhaps a more uh, interesting or reliable partner for the negotiations, because they trust somebody who hasn't got it more than somebody who has it and says, but you should not have it. So these are, these are uh, general ideas and elements when I was asked about nuclear strategy. NATO we can discuss. I would simply like to mention one more thing and then we uh, wait for your, uh, your contributions, which is Europe. Of course, last year was a very important country uh, year for, for Europe. And why? Because we finally got the Lisbon Treaty ratified. You know, the EU started after the Second World War with a little community for coal and steel and, and, and then enlarged and they came bigger and bigger. Finally, two years ago, three years ago, we had 27 member states, 27 member, but the rules, the basic rules were the same as 50 years ago at the Rome treaties, you know, with consensus rule and so on, and this didn't work anymore. When I was uh, uh, in charge of the presidency in Chicago and before at other places, when you have 27 people around a table and you should find an agreement, a consensus agreement, hardly possible. So they must find, they had to find other rules, uh, it had to become more democratic, the parliament wanted more voting and we, we also needed uh, a catalogue of basic rights. And Europe is really a different subject. I'm happy to come back and talk about Europe because it's so, so difficult to make it understand to other people that it was at the first 
a, a peace model for Europe, which had for hundreds of years wars and fighting and killing each other. So with this model we overcame. For Germany, the European community was the way after the Second World War and the Holocaust to get back into the family of nations and find some good relationship with all the neighbors. We wouldn't have had the unification without the consent of all our neighbors. Uh, and uh, uh, the Lisbon Treaty finally was ratified. It's new the, the new basis. And the, the question or the problems which came with the ratification is, as long as we were waiting for the Irish and the French and all the others to check at the end to ratify, we could easily say to the new uh, candidates like the Balkan countries, like Turkey, like uh, could say, wait, wait, we are not yet there. But now we have ratified the Lisbon Treaty, and now they are standing at our doorstep, and they, here we are, would like to become member of the club. Which is a, a really difficult situation. Can you enlarge an already, I would say, fragile big club before you have really consolidated what you got in? It, it moved, it, 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 it uh, grew too fast, I think. And it's hard to digest everything, particularly with the economic crisis. And now all these countries from Croatia is next, then comes Macedonia, then comes Bosnia. Serbia ask now, and when you have all these, then there is a big Ukraine standing at the doorstep, and Georgia, and, and, and down to Israel, everybody wants to join the club, which would destroy the club. So this is a, a hard times, but this is, it was a decisive year, and in a way it was important that we have the Lisbon Treaty ratified. Yeah, you see that is on our plate in the, in the, in the national affairs, and uh, I don't, I don't want to, to overstretch it and go now in the, the big uh, uh, global, global things. You know, the, we have the global, the global challenges and um, it's not only terrorism, it's not only energy. It's so simple things. We mentioned it this morning at the, uh, the governor's office. Water. Water is a, uh, suddenly not a, it's a local problem, it's a national problem, and it is an international problem. It becomes a security problem. Simple things, but also um, um, migration, immigration, uh, integration of these are international problems, are German problems, are American problems, are European problems. Um, climate change, I mentioned, hunger, development, all these are global challenges. And one thing is only clear, we, Germany, Europe and America must act together. If we do not work together, no problems will be found to the challenges of, of the future. Thank you very much. I'm really looking forward now to your, to your statements. Thank you. We have about six minutes. Um, we don't have a roving mic because of our system, so we'll just, uh, restate your question if that's possible. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Just recently, China surpassed Germany as the world's number one exporter. And I was wondering what the China was talked last week. Yes. I was wondering uh, <laughs> what the reaction to this was in the German press and media. Yeah, we saw it. Fine. I'm happy with it. <laughs> I mean, look, we have 80 million inhabitants, and they have, who is the Chinese, 1 point a billion? No, 3 billion? <laughs> many, many, you know, 1.3 billion. And that we were so long, we're the first. I mean, this is amazing. And I waited for it for a long time. And now the statistics are working on it. If they can fiddle and, and make it still another month given. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. I just uh, wanted to maybe have you say a little bit more about the future of the EU. Because I know that in the, the news this past week, um, Guido Westerwelle has been in, in Turkey, and uh, there's been a lot of, you know, back at home in Germany, a lot of fighting between the state, say, Isulu and the FDP and the Liberals about, you know, is Turkey going to, should we ever give them full membership, mm -hmm. or should they just have a, a special classification as privileged yeah. partner? Yeah. And I, I just, 
maybe a little more talk about what's what's behind that. You know, is it the issue of the common history and culture, and how would that affect future expansion of the? EU? You mentioned already everything. What's behind? Okay. It has to do with history. It has to do with economy. It has to do, of course, with the integration of our Turkish, strong Turkish uh, uh, community. Because uh, at the beginning, as you know, Germany was not an immigration country. We took guest workers. People came first from Italy and from Spain, later from Turkey, to work, to make some money, to go back or to... So they were guest workers. Over the years, they became immigrants. They stayed, second generation stayed, and now we have third generations. And the problem is, can we integrate them? And are they willing to assimilate and integrate? And somehow, and I can only say this feeling, I, don't, I cannot prove it, the, the, deba the debate which is connected to sorry to say though, terrorism and Muslim world, and somehow it's always connected, swaps into this de uh, debate. Can we integrate this? Because they are Muslims, majority, can we integrate them? And there were fights about can they build mosques in Cologne, you know, next to the, the cathedral. Uh, you saw in Switzerland the referendum. Though there is a general now uh, suspicion about these these groups and uh, this has nothing to do with modern Turkey. The problem with the Turkish, uh, uh, I would say, nation is it's also a split nation. You have the urbanites, I mean people in Istanbul and so they are probably Westerners or Europeans like, like we are, but most of our guest workers and immigrants come from Eastern Anatolia. And even more, many of our so-called Turks are not Turks but Kurds, and they have their turf wars on our territory. Um, so these are inner German debates, and, 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 and um, in in Europe, there is of course the fear if you bring in a nation with uh, which would be the biggest army in the EU, it would be uh, the second probably biggest country in the EU. Do you not? dissolute the, the, and, and the, the coherence of the EU, then you have the, the strategic problem. When you bring the EU borders next to Iraq, to Iran, to uh, the Middle East, suddenly you are really, you have a neighbor, you are a neighbor of these hot conflicts. All this plays a role. And then we have, we need somehow consensus in the EU. And even if Germany would have, I, I think we are, pretty 50-50 in favor and against, but there are other, other countries who are definitely against it. And yeah, uh, uh, including our friends in France, and that makes it much more difficult. Yeah, please. Um, what's Germany's position on UN reform? On? UN reform? Yeah, we will have afterwards a little talk here, but I can only tell you we are in favor, because again, like, like the EU, which was founded after Second World War, UN started here at the end of the Second World War. Um, uh, we, we think it does not represent our present times anymore, the global situation. You cannot, uh, with, with five uh, members, uh, dictate the rest of the world. And that is a decisive body. So you, we need some reform. We don't know how to bring it about against the vetoes and uh, different things. The, the question for our side is, for the German side is, we are the third biggest contributor and have no rights there. The, the question is, should we fight for a German seat or for a European seat? Because we think it's hard when you have only the French and the British in the Security Council to have a third European country in if you don't have at the same time Japan, Nigeria, India, uh, uh, Brazil, Mexico, and so on. So well, this is a, a general problem. But we definitely would like to, to see reforms happening soon. Thank you. Yes. Um, Herr Draus, we, uh, I'd like to, you mentioned the fall of the Berlin Wall. I'm a German student for many years in Germany. We highly respect your people and your cultural heritage in 
to what that um, event represents, not only to your country, but to the world. And I have a question in regarding to that event. Uh, recently, they published reports about the economic development in Eastern Germany since the fall of the wall, and it's still not quite up to the same standards of the West. What do you see as the still the major tasks to be accomplished, the, the major priority in uh, reuniting East and West? Yeah. Um, first of all, when you have a system like the former GDR, and you bring down the wall, the borders, what happens? People leave. And that happens. The brightest, the young people, the students, they all went west, first West Germany, and many went west and came to this country. I, f I f meet more Germans from former East Germany than West Germany suddenly here. Yeah? Um, secondly, you cannot, you can build the infrastructure, what we did, we pump in every year more than 100 billion from West Germany into East Germany to build up the economy. We have partly better infrastructure, roads, railways, telecom, than the West, but you cannot change hearts of minds of people so early. So you have still a residual uh, force, so to say, of East Germans who think the good old times. Um, I personally think it's a matter of time. You need one, perhaps two generations, and it will grow out. I think it's 20 years ago the wall came down, which means the students now, college students, have not lived, didn't live at that time. So for them, it's, it's history, it's book. But we still have many, many people who lived at that time. I remember the real, how complicated it's, it was with Berlin and the Four Powers Agreement and all the legal and the Soviets standing there, the military, and so there is a, a process which, which takes time, and uh, um, uh, telling you something here at Brigham Young, uh, you should know East Germany, the former East Germany, is an atheist country. There is nothing. There is desert. You, you, you see, that, that is a completely different society which needs to develop, and it takes time. It's not bad will on neither side, but it takes time. Well, if you have something urgent, stay here. Thank you, and I have some things you can please add yourself. Thank you very much. Germany's positions on everything from desertification to nuclear energy to the Security Council to women's issues. Uh, as you know, the UN is, is in, in, involved in many different kinds of topics. So uh, these are students who represent a very broad interest, mm -hmm. but what will happen is at the end of, of March, uh, we'll head back to New York for 10 days, and they will represent your country. So um, again, they're at the very beginning of, of their research. And uh, I think your, your presentation already has provided some very useful information in terms of giving us some very current and, uh, and important insights on Germany's um, uh, direction. Um, 
how would you like to pursue? Would you like to, to speak for a few I minutes? Have a, I have first a question to you because I see you sitting in front of me. You have computers and you have uh, notepads and you have books. Who had the Charter of the United Nations? It's a little book. It's just a tiny little book with the 100 articles of the United Nations. Before you start working or thinking about it, you should have a, the basic. It's like your Bible, the Book, book of Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> not, not seriously. Do you, do, do you have it? I have it at home. You, you have it. Did you open it already? Yeah? But uh, please, 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 this is really basics. Open this book and read the, 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 the main chapters and the main articles of the Charter, otherwise you will not understand it. And in this respect, uh, I'm very bad. I'm not a United Nations uh, expert. Never served there. We have always to do. Um, nobody had the text here. No, nobody had the text of you. Don't have it here. We can pull it up on our computer. Yeah. I I give you something, and please don't be shocked and forget it afterwards again. Type in Feinstaatenklausel. <laughs> do you know? Does that anybody understand what it means, Charles? Do you know what it means? No. The what? The starting clausel? No. Then I must explain it. Um, um, when somebody asked me about the uh, reform of the UN, my government is not keen. And please don't recall this. And don't say <laughs> anybody. Don't quote me on this, <laughs> please. Um, when you read the charter, you find article. An article which says there are two countries in the world you can invade, attack without any mandate, without asking anybody. They are the enemy of humankind, and these two countries are Germany and Japan. This is still in the text of the Charter, the Feinstaat, an enemy countries clause. Because at the end of the Second World War, when the United Nations were found in which city? I'm happy that you say San Francisco, another student body may just said, oh, Brussels or Rome or something like that, or San Francisco. No, they said because of the, the war, the end of the war, they are not part of the international community, so to say. And this was never changed. So in fact, it's obsolete because nobody uh, exists anymore. But it's still in the text. You must read this article, and you must understand what it means. You, you can easily attack and, and bomb Germany without any any uh, uh, anybody could say this is not correct. You didn't, don't need a mandate. So that is something. If you play Germany, you should always have it in your in your mind. Now and then again, uh, look please at the history of Germany in the UN. When did <coughs> Germany join the UN? Any idea? Roughly. I don't know, I don't want figures in years, simply in what, what situation? When did we change, uh, Germany and why? In the 80s. Not quite so late, but I simply tell you what happened. Did Germany join the UN? Mm -hmm. Did? No, that's what I'm just guessing. That's you what are I'm guessing? Talking. Yes. It did not, of course, because we had two Germanys, and the two Germanys joined the UN. And that was the problem why it was so late, because we had, uh, for many, many years, an ideological fight in the world, the good and the bad, the good and the evil. And of course, the communist side wanted to be, uh, no, the, the free, Germany wanted to become a member, and then the other side, the Soviet side, said no, only if our Germany, the GDR, becomes a member as well. And this was not, not uh, at the Adenauer and post-Adenauer era uh, the fact, so we didn't, we didn't uh, agree. And that's why we were stuck for many years until under the, uh, uh, the Brandt uh, Scheel government, Willy Brandt, we had uh, the basic treaties, the treaty on the basis of relations between the GDR and Germany. And then we had the Warsaw Treaty and this Ostpolitik, and only then it was possible 
to join the United Nations, and then we did it the same time, East Germany and West Germany, and we had two German delegations sitting there in the General Assembly and two foreign ministers, German foreign ministers speaking. So it's a very different from the usual <coughs> uh, membership. And uh, so look at the history, how Germany joined the United Nations and what the reasons were, why so late and which conditions. And then you understand more. Well, and the other, the other uh, preliminary mark is, as I said, we are the third biggest contributor. We pay and pay and pay, and uh, uh, we don't have a say. And in a, in, a, in a democratic, whatever democratic system you have, um, no taxation without representation. You know, no, mm -hmm. or uh, the the, the uh, who pays the pie but decides the tunes he plays, or something like this. So, but the overall political uh, political statement is the uh, the United Nations, as it stands now, the structures of do not represent uh, the world in the 21st century anymore. That's why we need reforms. That is uh, just a preliminary remark. But now I would like to hear from you what you think you can do there and why you are interested in doing it and which fields you think the most important. And it may be helpful since you don't know exactly the committees you'll be on to focus in on those committees that you're the top <clears throat> the areas you're interested in. So those of you who are interested in development topics may want to focus on that. Those who are interested in national security. Um, and again as Germany the, the key will be to understand these issues and to, and to present a perspective, so, so that as other schools interact with you, they say, oh, yes, of course you're Germany. There, there are several German universities that attend the conference. Oh, yeah, and yeah. so this will be very challenging. You'll have schools that will know everything about uh, German policy. So uh, perhaps if I may add, as, a German, as Americans, you are not educated in multilateralism, because you are a big nation, a strong nation. You feel the leader of the world, whatever you call it. We come exactly from the different side. We learned the hard way in World War that we cannot go alone, that we cannot act against the interest of neighbors and others and so on. So we are born multilateralist. We want to be embedded. We would like to be always to be embedded. We would like to have a mandate, a justification, uh, a legitimacy of everything we do outside of our borders. This country tended, tends to think in a different way. And that it will be uh, for you, uh, must change your, your mindset and, and, and think differently. It's, it's not about leadership and, and going alone or telling others what to do, but about finding multilateral uh, solutions, partnerships, coalitions, not just, just coalitions of the like-minded, that's easy, but find consensus. That is a, a different approach. Uh, what uh, is the uh, effect of the Iranian situation right now in Germany? Is it something that you're taking a lot of uh, uh, action on it, or, or do you have a very strong position, or do you think that yeah, Germany we do. divided? We are, no, we are in this uh, United Nations sanction group. We, we follow it. We, uh, we think it's right because our overall, <coughs> as I said in the other context of nuclear debate, we don't want Iran to have nuclear weapons. We don't want anybody to have nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, no, um, we are, we are uh, very concerned. The, the, the the very critical moment with Iran and nuclear weapons is, of course, Israel. Because Germany, with, with its past, has a, a big, uh, how to say, um, uh, interest in safeguarding and securing Israel. So we cannot allow somebody who says Israel should be deleted from the map 
to acquire nuclear weapons. That is, that is a, an even more complicated situation for us. On the other hand, uh, Iran or Persia is a very old nation, it's a very big and young nation. Uh, it has uh, long cultural ties with Germany. It had excellent ties with this country, for the Americans who armed the Shah and all the, uh, they brought down the, the old government, you know, the CIA and so on, when you look at the history. So it's ups and downs, and we are, tend to be more for continuity. And uh, um, the, my personal feeling is that the majority of the Iranian population, which is basically between I read to my surprise 16 and 28, I think 60% of the population is very young. They would like to have a life like you and we have. They are not interested in a, in a, in a mullah regime. But uh, if we can wait until this comes from outside, I know. I don't know. I, I know only if you put too much pressure on a country, you have a solidarity effect even in a, in a not liked regime. So it's, it's a really a, a, a balance, and uh, uh, I can't tell you. I, I, I know um, it would be a catastrophe if they get not only the bomb, but also the delivery system, because this is the combination with one thing you can't do much. And we know from the Arabs, the Sunni Arabs around Iran, not only they have this ideological and religious war with as the Shiites, they also fear Iran acquiring nuclear weapons, and then you have a chain reaction. Then there will Saudi Arabia and Egypt and whoever will suddenly ask for the same. And can you see these crazy people in the Middle East? I was not in the Middle East, so excuse me if somebody's all all having nuclear bombs and uh, their mindset that would be a great risk to to the, the world. But these are all personal remarks. It's not a not personal What does Germany consider its role in combating terrorism and providing international security? Uh, can you be a little bit more precise what you really want to hear? Yeah, how does it fill in, I mean, there's, of course, the US involved in military action yeah. throughout the world. How does Germany view its role in supporting that? Or what, what routes would it prefer to take? Can you imagine that before before yesterday we had a, a film a, a debut a festival uh, that it's up to the awards in, in Los Angeles, and one of the uh, biggest successes of German films was about the Bata Meinhof, the Bata Meinhof uh, Red, Bri Red Brigade. Yeah, the, not the Bata the, the movie. The film is called the Bata Meinhof uh, Gang. Or uh -huh. At, I, what I want to say, <coughs> we have our experience with terrorism long before 9-11, like, like Ireland and Britain has and other countries. So it's not the first time terrorism, we, we know what it is and we are, we, are, we are, of course, fighting it. Also international terrorism, we see as a threat. What we do not use, I would say the general uh, public and the politicians don't use the term as war, because the war is for us something. We, we say fight against international terrorism, uh, which truly is needed and, and needs cooperation, and we do, we do the utmost we can. But um, um, when it comes to uh, Afghanistan, I didn't mention it, and I don't want to go too far, because we must wait what this London conference, with upcoming London conference, in. In, in January, end of January brings. It is too easy, in my mind, personally, to think you can bomb them to hell, so to say, with military means, overcome crazy people. You, know, you can kill them, but that is not the solution. Uh, uh, so, uh, <coughs> terrorism, I don't know. You know, it had existed 100 years ago in the Tsarist Empire, and the First World War started with the, uh, the attentat in Sarajevo against the Archduke and, and, and 
terrorism existed. What is somehow peculiar for me, and I mentioned it before, and it's also very personal, that whenever something happens, there is some Ahmed or Abdullah or uh, whatever uh, involved in, which means why is the Muslim world always involved when something uh, in a terrorist act? I don't know why, but many people see it like this. And that's why they, uh, there comes this very strange uh, uh, connection between the two. Um, in Europe, terrorism, it's so, certainly not not as, as strongly perceived as here. But here it is also a matter of campaigning, you know, and if you are not playing this tune, you are not patriotic somehow. So uh, there we have a little bit uh, an easier play. <coughs> Yeah, I have another question on the threat. You keep coming back to climate policy. And um, I know that Germany has, has quickly become one of the world leaders on actively promoting climate change. And I know that on a German watch ranking, it actually showed that developing countries like Mexico and Brazil have a higher um, activity level of climate change than some industrialized countries like our own. I was wondering, do you see Germany working with developing countries to kind of maybe try to persuade industrialized countries to be more active? Yeah. How do you see yourself, Germany, influencing other countries to be as active as you are? Yeah, very much so, because we have discovered, first of all, that uh, uh, these climate change technologies are a very productive new field, innovation, new technologies, though it is not what this country, many people perceive, uh, uh, um, a financially or uh, negative economically model. Many people here think you are in the competition. Uh, if you if you raise uh, environmental standards, you lower your competitiveness because it costs more. We are not convinced. On the contrary, we see perhaps in the short time you must invest in new technologies, in renewables. Perhaps it costs a little bit more, you have solar, electricity coming from solar. But in the long term, at least what our experts say, uh, it, it pays. And uh, we can still afford, I admit in Germany, you have a lot of public money of su subsidies going in solar. We have these feed-in tariffs. People have solar cells on their roofs. They feed in into the grid and get uh, uh, per kilowatt a certain amount of money which is higher than the costs of uh, electricity you would produce out of oil or nuclear or coal but this is it's meant it's politically decided that this will be will lead us in the future but to your question with third countries of course we try since we are an exporting nation we depend on exports and we depend on being always at the edge of new technology to go with our uh, renewable solar, wind, biomass, whatever it is, to go abroad and find partners, cooperate, export our, our uh, and this is in the southwest where I'm now stationed here, one hour of our major markets here. For example, Solon, a big solar uh, company, is investing in Arizona. Uh, we have wind coming uh, in, in, uh, in Colorado. There is a big uh, wind park. Siemens just invested their millions. So we are convinced that this is good for business. And that is our, our new, um, new playing field, environmentally tied or connected technologies. Um, Russia seems to hold a particularly interesting bargaining power and situation in security and they seem to be using their um, energy um, sort of position <coughs> to, to their advantage. I was wondering you said that Germany is no longer engaged in nuclear <coughs> power activities. I was wondering first of all how dependent Germany is on percentage level on Russian energy 
And if so, how does that affect the formulation of German foreign policy? Do you find any, any catering towards Russian? Yeah, it's interesting how you phrase this question. Because it, it's, uh, when you listen to your wording, you think there is, there must be a, uh, a controversy, a uh, kind of, uh, um, uh, the ad adversary, the Russian and Europe or Germany. No, we have a completely different perception. We think you must bring in Russia into the international community, in international organizations, in the international e economy, simply to, to make them valuable partners. And uh, in energy field, you must not always uh, uh, think that we are the ones who need their energy. They need also customers to pay for their raw materials, which is gas and oil. So they are also interested in having reliable partners in their neighborhood. Of course, they could sell the same stuff to China. They would like to, to, to buy it cheaply in Russia. We, are, we do not have that interest. We would like to make Russia a valuable, reliable partner in Europe, not in the European Union, but in Europe and in the economic system. The more you bring them in, the more responsibility they have, the better it is for the overall being, uh, well-being of, of the continent. So we think they are strategic partners. We don't, you should, unfortunately, this Cold War thinking uh, is perpetuated, and often people still think of, of you know, the old, in the old uh, terms, but um, we, we think in, the, in this world you cannot you cannot simply put a fence and say you are on the other side of the fence and you are uh, exploiting us or putting pressure on us. No, uh, more 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 precisely to energy. We have a good energy mix. We are not dependent on Russia. It's a, a large extent, but that's why it's also one reason why we develop uh, uh, renewables. But we have a good energy mix. We are in. in European uh, net uh, grid. We have also uh, a connection to North Africa, uh, not only oil and gas. For example, in November, uh, German, French, and other companies signed a multi billion dollar contract to build a solar, a big solar field in the Sahara Desert and transport then the electricity to Europe. That is something spectacular. I, I, I was a little bit reluctant because of political questions, but if this works out, this is a completely new set of international relations. If you have North Africa producing energy for, for Europe. So there is a new world coming up. Up to now, we kept these people out. You know, the migrants were even sunk by the Italian Navy in the Mediterranean or kept in, 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 in ghettos in southern Spain or in France, or uh, the, the different world comes up, and I prefer to have a world of cooperation and investment and integration than this old one. We're almost to the end of, of uh, our Consul General's time, and I was hoping we might be able to implore upon him to, to maybe take a group picture before we go. Of before course we you head can. Out. But um, would it be, I wanted to ask one question. Um, in the United States, there's been a lot of discussion about the current, well, around the world, about the economic crisis. Yeah. And there's an interesting suggestion um, by the New York Times columnist Paul Krugman yeah. that, uh, that Germany got it right, that, that, that what's viewed as a, as a non-stimulus approach to, to, to getting out of this economic um, uh, situation might be might be the right way, and I, I wonder wonder what your thoughts are. Again, as we're trying to understand, I really appreciate the way you're framing your answers around the, the, the German perspective, because that's really what we're trying to understand: is how how, how does Germany view the, the global economic crisis, and how does the German government view the the most effective way to deal with mm -hmm. unemployment, uh, to deal with uh, mm -hmm. with with deficits. Well, um, unfortunately, I must tell you, I do not believe in uh, in all these experts' uh, opinions. 
those who analyze what, what the past is, it's always easy afterwards to know and to analyze why something happened or not. Those who go into the future, they don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, it's simply not true. Now, to your question, what is uh, interesting, I think national governments lost a lot of power because of globalization, because of multilateralism, because of new actors, because of new uh, uh, political weight. Um, there are some facts. One fact is certainly that the West is losing in this balance and China, Asia is gaining in the economic, in the global context that, that you can simply prove with figures. Uh, secondly, it's certainly uh, the case that we are interlinked, we are interdependent. There are no national solutions anymore. Even if Germany had, I don't know if they have it, if they had a, a model to overcome the national financial or economic crisis, it would not work because we are too much interlinked in the EU and in the transatlantic, in the transatlantic economy. So if something bad happens here, we are affected immediately and vice versa. So everybody who thinks in national terms is a loser to me. Uh, uh, no, because, uh, and, and look at the figures of, of, of international foreign direct investment. I mean, some companies, they simply place a billion here or five billion. Look what happened with General Motors and Opel. You see how interlinked Germany and, and Detroit are, not even the US. And that makes it so difficult to say, do the Germans have a recipe to... In some fields, we have uh, uh, good ideas like the Kurzarbeiter program, you know, short... Uh, uh, how do you pronounce it? Uh, how do you translate Kurzarbeiter, short temporary, labor, temporary worker. temporary worker program that you don't kick people completely out of the job. You tell them only you do uh, short term, only, only only four days a week, and we pay you from the rest seventy. But you keep them in the job. You keep their knowledge. You keep their uh, social benefit. These are some programs are really better than here, where you have more. You know, this kick them out and. That's it. But for the overall, the, the global economy, I don't think that one government and not Germany alone can remedy anything, really. Interesting. All right, well, let's uh, thank Council General Dress for his time. Thank you. Did you speak about the United Nations? Uh -huh. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> but you are the experts. <laughs> <laughs> We're learning. On our way.